this is Elizabeth. We're going to name the wives now. You know, we're going to do something that we haven't done in our histories. We're going to name, we're going to give them names and we're going to actually learn whatever we can learn about them. Because I can guarantee you, William Brigham Parkins, his history is a lot longer than Elizabeth Bull's history, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because the man's more important than the woman, right? So, so out of curiosity, yeah. where did you find information about these other uh, three women? It's only because there are a few oral histories that were recorded that 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 like historical projects or descendants just happened to record okay. that my cousin Ben Parkinson put together on a website. I but, see. But but the but the histories of these women are sparse. Gotcha. Hmm. Right? It's yeah. like a few paragraphs, uh, you know, wow. I was able to gather for all four of the wives. Wow. Not not the exhaustive history. You know, just just William Brigham Parkinson's obituary provides more information than most of the histories of these women. Wow. Mm. Um, so anyway, uh, that that's what I that's the information I was able to gather. So Elizabeth Bull is born in 1853 in Salt Lake City. Her parents were sent to colonize Morgan, Utah. Um, she met William while he was working on their farm. So he's going to work for the Bull Farm as a teen. He meets Elizabeth, who's one of the daughters on the farm he's working with, and she was his first wife. Um, uh, they were married in the endowment house, which makes me think that it wasn't a legal marriage. Now, I'm not sure about that, but he was definitely married. As I understand it, they were married in the endowment house, and this is where it starts to get dark, you know, you know, in, from Elizabeth's perspective, um, you know, they marry, they marry when he was 20, they marry when he was 21. Um, she was 20. So by the time he's 26 and she's 25, she had four children and he got off on a mission. So five wow. years into their marriage, they've got four children in five years. And then her husband sent off to England on a mission. Jeez. Just right? the four children under five, like the in amount five of years. That is, yeah, the amount of wow. stress on a body that they, you know, people even still now don't ever your really talk is, about. And then your <laughs> husband sent away for multiple years, mm. right? Yeah. So, wow. so that's, you know, that's, that's, you know, some of the main things I know about Elizabeth, um, you know, we'll talk later about the fact that eventually she got her own house. She died in 1922 of diabetes. So it's not totally fair to blame that on the polygamy. Um, but it was interesting that her tombstone just mentions her. It doesn't mention him. You know, like when you go back to Mormon pioneer ancestors, you'll always see the husband and the wife together. Yeah. But she's, she's mentioned alone on her tombstone. Later, mm -hmm. it turns out they got divorced. So I'm going to come back to Elizabeth Bull, okay. but uh, but 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 I don't want to give the ending away. So I'm leaving a few things out of Elizabeth's story. <laughs> and so um, here's a little bit. I'll, I'll just read about Elizabeth. Um, this was one of her descendants. Uh, the descendant writes. This is Lorna England Bingham Olson. She writes, my name is Lorna England Bingham Olson. I am the oldest grandchild of Elizabeth Bull and William Brigham Parkinson, MD. My earliest recollection of grandmother was when we had gone back to live with her after the death of my father, and I was four and a half years old. My grandfather was a doctor, so he trained my mother to be a nurse. That, that means his daughter, Lorna's mom, was trained to be a nurse. Um uh, she basically says he had been a polygamist and had divorced my grandmother. She having been the first wife of four, he stayed with the youngest family. That's, that's a little bit inaccurate. So even Lorna doesn't get the story right because it, William ended up staying with the third of the four wives, which is my mm. great grandmother, which is Edith, the youngest of the four Margaret, we're going to talk about, ended up as a disaster. And it would mm. make sense that Lorna didn't even know about Margaret because he did not end up, end up living with Margaret. 
but that's kind of another story. But here's where it's interesting. Lauren is not given all the information, but here's where it does come out that, that Elizabeth and William ended up getting divorced. And that's mm-hmm. something my mom wouldn't have even known. And I don't even know if my grandma Karma knew this, hmm. but here it is already one of the four marriages ends in divorce. And it's always interesting to me when any plural marriage in that time period does end in divorce because well, a couple things we're we're often sold as members of the church we're, we're sold on the fact that polygamy happened you know for that eternal salvation right right or that the women were being taken care of and uh there weren't enough men there's all these reasons why we're told that polygamy happened in utah back then um and so to see a divorce you're like okay well then they're willing to give up the eternal salvation it must have been pretty bad right in order to be willing to give up that ceiling or in this case whether or not she was actually sealed is a little bit of a mystery but it kind of gives a little bit more insight into the fact that things must have been bad enough to be willing to give up that celestial marriage which we know is the most important and why most of the women were willing to be in polygamous relationships to begin with Yep. So it says a lot when somebody in that and in that time era, divorce wasn't a huge thing back then anyway, whether you were in the Mormon church or not. So to all those different aspects, to have a divorce was a very that would have been a big, big deal. deal. Yeah. Yeah. And I was talking to my cousin Brett about this situation because he knows a lot about our genealogy. It so the first question was, were they ever legally married or not? There are reports that they were, and there are reports that they weren't. But there's definitely reports of the divorce. And the question that I came up with with Brett was, were they divorced because he abandoned them eventually? Were they divorced because they didn't get along? Or Brett's opinion was they got divorced because later he wanted to legally marry somebody else post-manifesto. And so he divorced the first wife to then be able to legally marry the wife that he ended up with. And at first I thought, well, man, it'd be better if he divorced on a technicality so that he could figure out some other arrangement and that it wasn't a divorce because they weren't getting along. But then I thought, no, wait a minute. That's worse that he's just going to abandon the first wife and divorce her on some technicality so that he could go marry some other wife so that he could then live with her. What's Mm. that like for Elizabeth to have been left behind and divorced so that her husband could go live with somebody else? Like there's no scenario where that sounds good to me. Right? No. no, absolutely not. And the fact that there is a record of the divorce leads me to believe that there would have to be record of a marriage. Like it would have had to be, I mean, you, they wouldn't, if there wasn't an actual marriage record, there would be no need for the divorce legally. So, I mean, that gives a big hint that they actually were at least legally married, whether or not they were. And then being in the endowment house, my guess is that they were sealed as well. But to, um, hmm. yeah, to break up and have a divorce you got to wonder if the technicality behind whether or not that would cancel the ceiling or whether or not they would view that as canceling the ceiling back then. Because nowadays, if people get divorced and they've been married in the temple, then they go and they get a temple divorce basically as well. But those are two separate things in the LDS church. Those don't go hand in hand. And so like you said, the technicality of, okay, well, if they got divorced civilly, would she still be sealed? But more importantly, if he wasn't going to live with her or continue on a relationship with her, then it doesn't matter what the technicality is at all. It matters about the living situation. If they weren't all, oh, I'm going to divorce you, but we're all going to still stay in the home and I'll be one happy family and still be living together, which it definitely did not sound like that's how it went, then it doesn't really matter what the circumstance was or whether or not she was sealed. Why would she even want to be sealed to a man that's going to do that? (laughs) Be stuck with him for eternity? Yikes. No offense yeah. to your grandfather. And when <laughs> these saying. women, yeah. And when these Mormon women entered into polygamy, did they ever envision that ultimately their their husband would leave them, end up living with the younger spouse, divorcing them and basically abandoning them? And when you look at the history I showed you about Elizabeth, she died in 1922 of diabetes and was blind for the 6 years prior to her death. So she died blind for six years with diabetes, Mm -hmm. having been deserted by her husband. Hmm. Like that's how Elizabeth Bull died. That's what she got 
as a thank you and as a reward. And we don't even know if she got eternal, her eternal salvation out of it. Because, yeah, like you said, with the divorce, did she even qualify for eternal salvation? So that's that's how that's what Elizabeth got out of the deal. No one remembered her. Her husband left her, shacked up with one of the younger wives, and she dies abandoned, blind, six years without support. Like mm -hmm. that's a I don't maybe I'm uh -oh. making it sound worse than it really was, but that's what the documents show. No, I think well, and since she was the first wife, when she was first married, she may not have known that he was ever going to live polygamy at that point, That's right? That's right, when she married him. So she, she may not have known what she was getting totally. into. Absolutely. Well, mm. not that women really have a choice anyway, either, exactly. because, I mean, exactly. yes, yes, they definitely, um, like you said, your grandfather's wife, you know, when she found out, you're going to practice polygamy, I'm out of here, good for her, I admire her a ton for that, that wasn't as common, and DNC 132 clearly states that if a guy wants to be able to grab, hey, if they want another virgin, if the wife says no to that, they're going to be destroyed. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, in that situation, yeah, women definitely, I don't think there's any way a woman could fully comprehend what that is going to look like until it's already, I don't want to say too late, but it's already upon them, you know? And like you said, she got out, your grandmother got out before it actually happened, knowing, you know what, that's just not going to work for me. But once, okay, well, that is a celestial law and I'm not supposed to say no. And so then he takes on another wife and then you're stuck in that situation. That can be a bad pendulum that you're just never going to be able to get out of that cycle. It's, or it's going to be very hard or you just get abandoned later and all of it was for not anyway. Right. Yeah. So it's heartbreaking. However, it happens. Yeah. Yeah, and it makes sense why these women are forgotten because they live I hate to say it, but they live shit lives. And so yeah, you don't want to you don't want to remember them and talk about them because their lives sucked, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's better to forget them. Now we're not done because they it gets a little bit worse for Elizabeth, but oh. I'm, I'm saving it till till wife 3, okay? <sighs> so so I think Elizabeth, I think it's fair to say Elizabeth got the shaft when it comes to polygamy. Um, let's go ahead and go to wife number two, which is Clarissa. Okay. Clarissa was born in 1857. She was the second wife of, of William. Um, we, she married William when she was 17. So she was, you know, underage by today's standards, teenage bride. He was 23. She was 17. Okay. Six year difference. That's not awful. Um, you know, but it's, but he's, you know, that's interesting, right? Um, here's here's where it gets dark for Clarissa. When William was sent on a mission at age 26, um, he lived with Clarissa and Elizabeth together. So, so in this case, it was like your family, Sam. Um, William lived with both his wives in the same house, apparently. Hmm. Um, so they lived together for eight years. So the so, so those two wives lived together for eight years and by reports, they got along well, which sounds like your reports of your, your family growing up, Sam. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a quote that, that, that said they never had any disagreements. Now mm. I think that's garbage. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> I think that's, that would be I something. I don't see how two women could live together in any circumstance and never have any disagreements. <laughs> But, right. I think that's oh. dumb and, uh, and ridiculous. Yeah. But th hey, that goes hey, to show how it's, 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 it's deceitful. It's you put a shine on it. You make it sound awesome. Um, it's a sign of deception to me that they would, that anyone would ever say that. Why would anybody ever say that any two people living together never had any disagreements unless they're hiding something or trying to portray something as being better than it is. Right. It makes no sense. Yep. Yeah. Because no one would ever expect any two adults to live together for eight years and never have a disagreement. So yeah, it's there's a no kind way. of deception, right? Right. Yeah. Hey, quick question. Yeah. Going back to the last slide, what was the difference in how many years after he had married his first wife did he marry Clarissa? So so how he long? married he married he married uh, years, Elizabeth right? in 1873. Okay. And then he married uh, Clarissa in 1875. So okay. he married Clarissa two years after marrying Elizabeth. 
Okay. I only asked that because when it said they um, lived together for eight years, I was just wondering how long when he was sent on his mission at age 26, they had already been together as sister wives for about three years before he got That's sent right. away. That's okay. Right. I was yeah. just trying to get that. Yeah. Th together. Those are really important questions. Well, and after, and after he was sent away, maybe at that point is when they really bonded as two wives in exactly. the home together without without having to share a husband anymore because he was then out of the house. So I can see how they may have become really close and good friends at that point. Uh, you know, but I, I, I know for a fact that women, they're, they're, they're still human. It, it's, it's not <laughs> in, in a plural, plural marriage. There's going to be disagreements and difficult, uh, challenging feelings when you see another wife with your husband. Yeah. Do we know how long William was on his mission for? I'm going to guess it's a couple years, but I'm not okay. totally sure. Okay. Gotcha. Sorry. Yeah. I was just thinking timeline I've when I'm like, okay, that. they lived together, for, lived together for eight years. You know, she he got a second wife, two years. So, and then it was another three years. So they had already been together for three years, the sister wives, and then they still lived five more years after that. So they would have been, um, yeah, been living together for quite a while. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I would love to know how long William's mission was, but I'll tell you this, it was long enough for two of his children to die and him not to attend the funeral. And so oh, that man. I don't mean to be flip about that, but this is where it gets really dark. So William has two children with Clarissa and five, was it five we said or four with it with was four children? and five years, four okay, children. Yeah. And so, then that would have meant three years, because if he left on his mission at 26, right? So in three years he had two children with Yeah. yeah. Yep. So he's got so he's got six children at the time with two wives, six children with two wives, all under the age of what, five or six? Yeah, By the five. time he gets sent on his mission. Wow. What's that? Yeah, under the age of five. Yeah. Because right? yeah, five years till he'd gone on his mission. So six, six kids, kids under kids five. Under the age of five with no husband on the frontier and no financial support. So basically their dads, Clarissa's dad and Elizabeth's dad, have to financially support Elizabeth and Clarissa just mm. for them to make ends meet. And then I learn that two of Clarissa's children get scarlet fever while William's away. They get sick. He's a doctor eventually. He's gone. They get sick and the kids die while William's on his mission and he misses the funerals because he's not able to get back in time. Wow. It's wow. Crazy. I cannot imagine. Like, where's the revelation in that? Where's like, we're taught that when we get called on a mission, it's of God and God ordains it. What in the heck was God doing calling William on a mission, knowing that, that, two of his kids were going to need their dad, but instead they were going to die while the mom is watching her two babies die without any husband support because the church needed him to go get more converts in England. Like this is abusive to me and it's, it's egregious and irresponsible hmm. yeah. and it's tragic and it makes it me is. sad and sick um, to read about that. But it gets worse because William comes home and guess what? He immediately goes off to medical school in Chicago. And like you asked, Melissa, mm -hmm. did, he take, did he take Elizabeth and Clarissa with him to Chicago? No. He leaves them again and he goes off to college. So for the whole time he's studying in Chicago and Louisville, guess what? The wives are just literally baby makers without a dad in the home while he's off having fine, you know, studying medicine at the best schools, who knows what he's doing back East while he's in medical school, but he's certainly being intellectually stimulated, advancing in his education while his uneducated wives are back home alone, um, you know, uh, raising the children. Now, didn't he have his third wife by the time that he left for college? Uh, Sorry to go back. I'm getting, in time I'm getting there. I'm getting. Oh, okay. There. <laughs> I was like the third wife intrigues me, and also, is there any indication as to how he paid for all of the schooling? Was he sent by the church to go become a doctor? 
because I don't know that. I don't know that. It's Those interesting that I mean, obviously he's self-made. We know that at twelve he had no one, right? So to even be able to serve a mission, I mean, at least at that point, you know that the church was paying for it as they should. Maybe. And maybe <laughs> unless it was that without purse script thing, I don't even know. Yeah, who I guess that's true. But so he's serving a mission, which you know costs money, and the wives are being taken care of by their fathers, right? But then to come back and immediately go to school, which even colleges back then, that's not cheap, especially at good schools. No. And so at this point, I mean, everything you shared about um, him being prosperous has was like post after he became a doctor, after he already had that education. So it makes me really wonder, Yeah. someone had to have been yeah. paying did, for it. Did the and church I wonder pay if it was him? a church. Did the church pay for his mission? Did the church pay for his medical degree? Um, how how did how did that happen? Those are all great questions, and I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I don't funny. know whether he worked his way through medical school. I, I I would love to know that. That would be a very important piece to know if you could ever find it out. If he was sent away to college from the church, or if he chose that life to be away from his family. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, and I wonder too, because it reminds me a lot of the FLDS. Sam would talk about the fact that most of the people who went and got educations, it was specifically the church who told them, you are going to go and become a doctor, or you are going to go and become a dentist. So we have these things for the community. Yeah. It wasn't very exactly. often in the later days, am I right? That that they got to choose yes. later on. There was definitely some assigning people for in certain careers and that type of thing for sure. Yeah. So yeah. It'd it would be, be interesting. smart for Brigham Young to have a bunch of engineers and doctors and lawyers and, and educators to build up Zion, right? Yeah. They had so, to have seen that as something that would be worthwhile for them. And at this point, it seems like everything else he's done, you know, at the expense of his family, you'd almost feel like the only, if he's already expensing his family for the greater good of the church, like mission, then it would be an easy sell to say, well, now you should go become a doctor for the church and yeah. leave your family again. Mm -hmm. And, and, and his family ends up benefiting from him being a wealthy, educated doctor later. But it, but I, my point is the kids probably benefited from that, but the wives suffered is, is my, is my take. Yeah. It came on just like slavery, just like the prosperity of new England in the 1800s and the 1700s came on the back of slave labor, the prosperity of the, of both the Parkinson clan, William Parkinson and the Mormon church came on the back of women being exploited. Yeah. So, well, it, it just, just a observation here. I mean, you, uh, church members will talk about the suffering of Emma Smith and everything that she had to endure and everything that she had to go through. Uh, but you, it, you would think uh, it would make sense that a lot of women in the early days of the church went through similar situations and yeah. had to deal with certain things and endure uh, similar things that Emma Smith also went through. For sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, really interesting tidbit. When I tell people I really want to encourage them to do their genealogy, you find these weird coincidences because my sister Gina, who's passed away, she has three children. And her one daughter, and, and, and Gina has li lived in Chicago for a long time. Not anything related to any of this history. It's just she married a Canadian. They, he ended up losing his job in Toronto. So they moved to Chicago, which was kind of near uh, Canada, raised her three kids in Chicago. One of her daughters ended up going to medical school. Do any of you want to guess what medical school <laughs> her daughter no was going to? That was crazy at Rush Medical College. My, my my niece, Julianne Hall, Faust Hall, is a graduate of Rush Medical College or <laughs> University. And she wow. also did a res residency there. What a bizarre, of all the medical schools and residencies <laughs> in the world, my niece graduated from the same uh, medical school as her great great grandfather did. Is that, Does she it, know that? Does she, have you? Has I told anyone, her. I don't think oh, she super cares, but I think oh, it's yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting. Wow. And she's not. And she's not in the church anymore. She left the church um, in her teen years, so okay. she doesn't care about Mormonism like I do. Oh, okay. <laughs> she's not. <laughs> I think invested. it's cool. I think it's yeah. Cool. I think yeah. it's cool. And then my other sister lives in Kentucky. And of course, that's, you know, he graduated from University of, of Louisville. So anyway, 
what we don't, what we know for sure is that the women suffered while William was on his mission and then off to medical school. And then of course, how did Clarissa die? She died unexpectedly in 1903 at 45. When? While William was in Chicago doing postgraduate work. Right? Wow. That is such a long period of time because, I mean, he left because she was 17 when he was 23, right? So the first time she was left, she would have been 20. So then you're talking 25 years and he's still gone somewhere else after 25 years of marriage, you know? Because sometimes you think, I mean, at least my mind goes to when you hear of, oh, women having to make big sacrifices while their husbands are in medical school. That's something that you hear sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. And then they end up living prosperous and they're like, if we can just get through these times or I'm never going to see my husband. But 25 years later and you still end up dying while your husband's doing more something else somewhere else all the time. It sounds, oh. She did not. <sighs> Clarissa, I don't think Clarissa or Elizabeth had a marriage. They no. just didn't it doesn't sound like it. No. They, they were, they were single women living together, raising a crap ton of kids without a husband. Yeah. And that's, that's just a fact. They didn't that's have fair. a husband. Neither of them had a husband. You have to wonder how often he would travel home, right? Just like, long enough to have a bit to make babies. I mean, literally. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously they continued to have children, so he would have had to visit at times, but interesting to know, it would be interesting to know how often he would travel back. And I'm curious at that time how long medical school was. Well, because, and if he was working himself through medical school, it may have taken a lot longer to even get through medical school. Yeah. Right? Well, and at that point, his education up to that point, it didn't sound like he had had a lot of formal education before that. No. At least from, I mean, the little information that we're going I off of. I don't any. I don't know yeah. of any, any college before medical See, school. See, so then to go in, I mean, yeah. I'm very curious. Uh, I'm going to look up afterwards and Google, how long does it take? Because now that's a super long time. But even back then, you know that that had, that was a long stint, yeah. probably much longer than his mission was. Right. Yeah, for sure. Very little Way time longer. in between. Way longer. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But again, we already we already basically said Elizabeth got the shaft. I think Clarissa, can we say Clarissa got the shaft? Can uh, we say, yeah. you know? Yep. She's nice at 45 while her husband's still not settled yet. Like Clarissa got the shaft. And there's her tombstone. And again, she, she it's it's mm -hmm. just her on the tombstone. No mention of her husband, even on her tombstone, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So, um, one quick, you know, one reflection on Clarissa by Hazel Parkinson McAllister. Um, this is her daughter. Okay. So, Clarissa's daughter, Hazel, writes My mother had seven children, all born in different towns, except the first three Albert, Clarissa, and Leona. They were born in Morgan, George in Colville, Mark in Lewiston, Hazel in Hyde Park, and Alice in Lewiston. The reason the families were moving around was because of the manifesto. Hmm. My mother and the first wife, Elizabeth, lived together for eight years and never had any disagreements. They must have been angels, or they lied. <laughs> I'm sure we were one of the happiest polygamous families in the church my half brothers and sisters are very dear to me. My mother died in in 1903, very unexpectedly, while my father was in Chicago doing postgraduate work, and that's and this is where I got some of that information again from an oral history. But um, one another thing that it showed is that because they were breaking the law, violating the law running around evading the law because they were breaking the law. They were not only without a husband a lot of the time, but they were moving from city to city to city to evade the law. Hmm. You got to wonder why they would make them move when the husband wasn't around. You know what I mean? They could have played off single motherhood and said, what are you talking about? We don't have a husband. You well, they were, guy around here? they were living together. Remember, yeah, Elizabeth and Clarissa were living together. Well, I guess that's true. But I'm just saying, if there wasn't a husband to pin it to, it's interesting that they put so much effort. Like you were saying, after the manifesto, they still practiced polygamy for a while. And there were a lot of polygamous families around. So it's interesting that when they say they were forced to move, we obviously know that some man in some position told them they had to, right? 
It was not these two women, I guarantee, that were like, we should probably move again while we don't have a husband around. And but some for some reason we need to be scared. That mm -hmm. means that there was some man in a power position saying, You should be scared. We need to move you. Because I guarantee they didn't have the resources to move either. And so to be told that and to be moved around, obviously by somebody, and then on top of that, was there even a need for that fear in the first place? When there, I'm sure there was. I, rarely, like, like the federal marshals or whatever, were were imprisoning polygamists, seizing their property. Like, there's a reason the manifesto was issued. It's because law enforcement, federal law enforcement, was making the lives of polygamist Mormons unbearable for the five mm -hmm. or ten years leading up to the manifesto. So I believe. Uh, I believe that they were on the run. I believe that there was a real legitimate legal threat to their safety. Um, and if you think about it, if Elizabeth was legally married uh, to William and Elizabeth and Clarissa were living together and they kept having these young kids pop out <laughs> and William was coming back to visit regularly they, it would have been hard for them to hide the fact that they were a polygamous family. And so yeah. all of that, to me, would would cause it to make sense why they were constantly on the run from the law. Hmm. Yeah, this is true. Yeah. Yeah. No, I can, I can see, see that. that. I can see that for sure. Um, and I mean, I guess one of them could have moved and the other one stay behind i guess that could have been a solution as well i'm not sure why they but i think they relied on each other to just survive while the dad yeah, maybe at that point they were so close they didn't want to live apart that's and, and the children grew up together as well so that's something to consider they probably and i'm sure want the to. kids were helping the family survive right exactly yeah. like in your like in your case sam mm -hmm. yep yeah it's just yeah infuriating and you got to wonder like if it was william coming back and moving them again i Right. Would wonder if it was some other priesthood Tended head family, that was their dads, their brothers, you know. Yeah, who knows? All I know is it'd be some man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and when and when Hazel when Hazel writes, My half brothers and sisters are very dear to me, it's probably because Hazel grew up in this home where there was no dad and the and the half siblings all become became besties and 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 lived together for so long right oh yeah oh yeah yeah so i just think there's there's so much that's just a, a paragraph like this is so rich and fascinating mm -hmm. to, to me um right. but again the mormon church joseph smith in the articles of faith one of the articles of faith that joseph smith told the world was um, we believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, magistrates in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. So what Joseph Smith would tell the world is that we're law-abiding citizens. But what he would actually do and what Brigham Young and, and his successors would do was violate the law left and right, hide and lie about it, and deceive people as 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 criminals, as felons, Right. And so there is this real legitimate history of lawlessness that is not only in Warren Jeffs and the FLDS history, it's in my history as well. Yeah. My my ancestors were criminals, fugitives fleeing the law because they were they were breaking the law and hiding hiding it and lying about it. Yep, all all for eternal salvation though. I mean yeah. that that eternal oh, yeah. salvation. Yeah. If, yeah, if eternal salvation is at stake, I mean, I've seen it firsthand. I've done it myself that uh, you, you kind of do what you have to do to, to survive and, and to continue living on what you are taught is the only way to return to the highest degree of glory, as you mentioned earlier. Yeah, it's that only part. When there's only one way, mm -hmm. then that's when nothing else matters. Yeah, yeah. Um, interestingly, in Karma's history and my grandmother's history, she writes about Clarissa. So this is the one instance where Karma actually mentions one of her other mothers and and uh, you know some half siblings. So Karma writes. Um, someone asks Karma in an interview, "What about the second wife? Who was she, and where did she come from?" And so Karma describes Clarissa's life. And she basically tells a little bit about what their life was together. 
Uh, she says Clarissa came from a fine family in Lewiston. She had about the same number of children as my mother did. They were very good friends. My mother was very fond of her. So this is now karma living with Clarissa instead of Clarissa living with Elizabeth. So we know that Clarissa lived with Edith, the third wife, for at least part of the time. Um, my mother often told me how they would visit together. Uh, when it was time to have dinner, they had so many children. When they got them all together, they would cook corn for them. They would cook in a boiler. They used to have boilers that they would boil their clothes in. When they laundered them, they would put the corn in those big things and cook it. Mother, meaning karma, really loved her, meaning Clarissa, but she died when her youngest boy was 17. He came to live with us, so that made a big family for mother. We usually had hired a girl in those days. We would have someone work for us. They were glad to be paid and come to help with the housework. Mother usually had someone did that. And so what we find out later is that when Clarissa died relatively young, Edith, the third wife, helped raise one of Clarissa's teenage sons. Hmm. And Karma knew that son and kind of grew up with them. So anyway, um, there was a there was a point when Clarissa lived with Elizabeth, and then there was a point where Clarissa was I don't know if Clarissa lived with with Edith, but Clarissa was close with Edith. And Clarissa's children and Edith's children all spent a, line, a lot of time together in Logan. So yeah. that's interesting as well. And that gives a little bit of insight, too, to the fact that at this point, um, William must have been pretty successful in order for them to be able to hire help. Right. Even oh. with that many children, like Sam said, at this point, like you have to have, you know, kids start really young having to help. But if they're hiring out at this point, at least they're reaping some of the benefits of oh. his status. For sure they were. For sure they were. Um, and and let's let's actually touch on that. This was a really fun quote or an interesting quote that I pulled out. Um, this is from a the um Taggart family newsletter. Some guy named Spencer Taggart is describing uh I think his mom or grandma, but he basically writes Six days before her 18th birthday, Clarissa married William to become his second wife. Two years earlier, at the age of 21, he had married Elizabeth Bull, whom he had come to know and love while working on the family's farm in Morgan. We know nothing about how Clarissa met William and Elizabeth. This is where it gets fun. But we can believe they were a satisfactory threesome. <laughs> As William and Elizabeth and Clarissa, as Elizabeth and Clarissa lived together while their husband was in England on a mission, and later while he attended Rush Medical School in Chicago. So I just thought that was really funny and interesting that they were referred to as a threesome. <laughs> I've never heard that from a polygamous standpoint. That's very interesting. Me neither. <laughs> a satisfactory threesome. <laughs> so um thought that was kind of funny okay wow. so here's another one of the darkest things that i uncovered learning about my polygamous ancestry is because i left out something really fundamental to wife number one's history so remember we talked about elizabeth and clarissa raising their kids while elizabeth's gone finally when William comes back. He finishes his medical degree. They're, I guess it's post-manifesto now. They're, they're ready to settle, and they choose Logan where he's going to set up his medical practice. William comes back into town with both Elizabeth and Clarissa, and he buys, as I understand it, he buys them each their own house. So once oh. William moves to Logan, Elizabeth gets a house and Clarissa gets a house. So to your point, Melissa, they're now starting to reap the financial benefits of their sacrifices of him becoming a doctor. And all that's noble and good, and, and I'm happy for them. Um, uh, here's where it gets dark for me. Once Elizabeth is set, a wife number one, is set up in her own house, because William's still gone all the time, and because she has so many kids, she decides to hire some help. And so oh. she hires 
17 year old Edith, um, Edith Benson, who was the daughter of Apostle Ezra Taft Benson, who was not the prophet that everybody knows, but his dad or grandpa. So this was the first Ezra Taft Benson, who in the church history is known as Ezra T. Benson. He has a daughter, Edith. He dies. Edith is raised poor, right? So Edith needs a job to make ends meet, even though she's the daughter of a deceased apostle. So you guys know where this is going. Oh, yes. So Elizabeth gets her new house. Finally, finally, William is living in the same town as Elizabeth and Clarissa. He's He probably makes visits to Elizabeth, makes visits to Clarissa, takes turns visiting the two households. But he until, needs the nanny too, huh? Until what? Until Elizabeth <laughs> hires the nanny to help out. She was 17 years old at the time that she was hired. And guess what? William falls in love with the nanny. So I have my own Fanny Alger in my own line of polygamous ancestry. William effing marries Edith, the nanny, when she's just a few months after her 18th birthday. And guess what? He because it's because it's around the time, either right before or after the manifesto. <coughs> He has to leave town and move to Oregon. So <laughs> after William moves back to Logan, he abandons Elizabeth and Clarissa to marry underaged or right of age Edith, my great grandma, and he moves to effing Oregon and again abandons his first two wives. So he so he marries Edith and then moves to Oregon with her. Moves to Oregon, as I understand it, because the 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 federal marshals would have been around there. He would have been busted for marrying her, and so he marries her and moves to Oregon and leaves his wives again. Wait, so does he take children. Edith with him? And he took Edith with him. Oh so he did take Edith. Okay. So so he didn't just marry; he ran off with the nanny. He ran off with the nanny to Oregon. Oh God my gosh, it. John! I'm I can't so even upset. hear this. And this is my this is my great grandma. I know. My well, he, he, ob he obviously, he obviously, you know what I mean? it yeah. obviously wasn't his choice though. He had a revelation that it needed to be done. <laughs> God did <laughs> it. We, we all know that, right? God did it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. God did wow. it. Dude, any any thoughts on like that? To know that my great grandma was the equivalent of a Fanny Alger, and that and that they did that. That that she was involved in William. A bit, yeah, and what's it like? What was it like for Elizabeth to have made all those sacrifices for all those years, raised all those kids? Finally, they're settled, and then and then William runs off with a girl. How many years younger at this point? So he he's thirty four, and he marries an eighteen year old. So he's marrying Edith, 16 who's years sixteen younger. years younger than he is. And he's not just running off with the underage woman, but he's moving away. He's running away with her. What was that like for Elizabeth and Clarissa to have that happen? You, you got to wonder if at that point is when Elizabeth maybe stood up and said something or disagreed in some way and led to their divorce. You, I would, you have I would to, hope you that have she stood up for herself at that point. Like, like you, you have to wonder if it was her that said, you know what? I'm done with you. I want a divorce. F off. How could you do this to us? How could right. you run off with my nanny? Right. <laughs> when you've been gone for years and we finally settled here and you're going to run off with the 18 year old nanny. Yeah. And how frustrating, just like the overall like scope of polygamy. Why is that so common? Why is that something, you know, if you're going to try to claim that it's, this spiritual, that it's revelation. Isn't it interesting that it keeps revealing itself as the nanny? Like really, that it's exactly. always the hired help, that it's the underage girl or the very young girl who happens to be around and that just happens to be the person. It's like, it's so sadly and disgustingly predictable. Well, they always have an excuse to try to 
I guess, justify their decisions or their so-called revelations and by saying that, well, it was God that put them in that home at that time. It was God that led this person to meet up with me. And, you know, they, they all have their excuses and reasons for trying to justify it. But uh, in the big scope of things, if you step back for a minute, you realize, wow, this is there's obviously something very wrong here. Yeah. Or, or I heard a lot growing up, right. That like, okay, in that situation, if her father had died, he's just taking care of her because you know, the money that they could have paid her as a nanny wouldn't have done the job. No, mm -hmm. he needs to marry her and make sure that, you know, she has tons of offspring for him. That's, that's the best way to take care of a young girl instead of, you know, paying them for their work and letting them go and lead lives with someone their own age. So, you know, yeah. that makes a whole lot of sense. It's infuriating. <laughs> well, I will say that there have, I mean, it it's tricky because uh, I was raised this way as well. And uh, women that are raised in this from the time they are born, they are being taught about how amazing it is, what a privilege it is to be a part of such a great celestial law that at the time they are young teenagers, they actually in some cases want to get married to a man that you know that may be already practicing polygamy or they know will eventually be practicing polygamy but i'm not saying that it, i'm not saying that they would naturally want that it's just it's being it's being forced upon them from of such a young age that's you will hear some women say no this is what i want this is the way i should be living or edith's father was polygamous right as an apostle as well. So I mean, I, he, yeah, has, I so. he has that example too. So you're right. It's easy for us to get mad and frustrated for them because they don't know any better. Right. And we have all this information to know. And at that point, maybe she didn't see the future or sometimes you hear too, where if they feel like they're the favorite wife, Oh, well, he's running off with me and leaving the other wives behind that could mm -hmm. make her feel special or, you know, and if he's rich and wealthy and well to do and, well, I'm going to be his favorite and things are going to be great for me. They may, you know, things might suck for the first two wives, but I'm going to get to be the favorite. I'm going to get all of his, all of his attention and I get all of his money and I get to go to the celestial kingdom. That might not actually look like that bad of a deal for an 18 year old girl. Exactly. And that's exactly, I don't want to get ahead, but that's exactly how it plays out. Edith ends up being the favorite she ends up being the one that he ends up living with when he finally, finally settles down after his fourth wife, because there's another one to come. Um, but she benefits of all the ones she benefits. And, you know, I've got, I feel really ambivalent because this is my great grandma and I want to love her. Right. And I want to love my great grandpa, but she was an orphan. She was underaged. She was the nanny. And then she was made the favorite at the expense of the previous two and at the expense and neglect of the previous two wives and their children. So am I happy that the other women got neglected and, and the other children got neglected and rejected and, and were kind of put aside for the favorite, like who wants to be the non favorite spouse or the neglected or put away spouse. And, and by the way, what is freaking William doing marrying someone 16 or 17 years younger? Who's the nanny? Who's an orphan? That's just got all that gross Joseph Smith vibes that, that made me, makes me hate Joseph Smith, uh, makes me hate Joseph Smith's behavior and detest his, his, uh, his character. That's my great grandpa. And it kind of bums me out a little, and maybe he was a good man. I don't know, but like, this makes my stomach sick, you know, to learn this, about my great grandma. Yeah, it's it's hard because, you know, like Sam said before too, yeah, we can look back and be like, oh, that's disgusting and horrible of your great grandfather and that's awful. And at the time, there's just no way to know what their intentions are. Or sometimes when they get in their minds that they have those revelations that they were to take on and they might not even, I dare say that there's times where I look and I see and I'm like, I don't even know if they recognize the sick perverted part of it or if they truly in their mind believe that it was revelation and that's what God was telling them to do. There's oh, for that sure. piece. For sure. Yeah. That they, so he could be being the best man that he thinks is possible and not even fully understanding what he's doing and how he's doing it. And I'm not being fair to William. I'm not painting a complete picture at all because when you hear about people's, especially his patients recollections of him, he was all you know working night and day 
traveling throughout the county, helping the sick, saving lives, doing house calls, being kind to everyone he meets. Like, he's a victim just like everybody else. And he was probably a really good man, a really generous man. Uh, there are accounts that he wouldn't charge people if they didn't have money, that he would treat them for free. So this is just a guy living his religion. It just so happens to be an abusive, patriarchal, cultish set of beliefs that he had. And he was an otherwise probably a pretty good man, but he was doing, sometimes they say it takes a cult to make good people do bad things, you know? Mm, yeah. Well, and I mean, based on, or depending on your belief, if you truly believe that God speaks with you through revelation and you happen to be eating dinner at your wife's home and the nanny walks through and you see her and you say hello to her and you meet her and then th that night or a couple nights later you have a dream about something or the other that uh, you take as revelation that you should be with her <laughs> you, you know i mean there's so many ways these things could have happened because of the belief system yeah and you're you you're really just finding her hot and you're in your in your marriage has probably gotten stale and just like a man today or a woman might just go, I want a cute young thing. Like that's what's going on in his nervous system. But he's able to process that through the filter of Doctrine and Covenants section 132 of the prophet that he worships as the next most righteous to, than Jesus in the history of mankind. And so he's able to process it all in very spiritual righteous terms, even though it's a very human animalistic impulse right <laughs> yeah but it, it all yeah. comes yeah like you said it's really that it's the system the system got him yeah. too yeah <laughs> yeah but it is illegal let's let's just acknowledge that oh yeah yes absolutely that, that part no for way sure. to deny this is illegal behavior yeah absolutely yeah so um so a couple things we know about edith she was born in 1867 in logan Again, her her dad was Ezra T. Benson, an apostle. So she came from prestige. And so I'm sure one of the things William liked about her was that she came from a prestigious family, even though the, the prophet Ezra T. Benson had died. Um, one thing that was interesting is she was rebaptized at age 17. And you hear about rebaptisms happening with Brigham Young and with a lot of those 19th century Utah Mormons. But I'm dying to know why was she rebaptized? What was that about? Oh my gosh, I didn't know this. This is a part of history I didn't. I was not aware of. But I can, but but kind of is, wow. Because Warren Jeffs was rebaptizing people within the FLDS community, so maybe he got that from something in history. Maybe that's where he got that idea. Oh, for sure. I don't know. Oh, I had oh, never, so Sam, I've never did, heard that. Oh, so you guys don't know that Brigham Young. Uh, taught rebaptism. I had never I have heard that. Never heard that till oh, right yeah. now. Totally, totally rebaptism was a Brigham Young kind Whoa. of thing. What did he say the purpose was? Was it to cleanse of sins, or was it to become yeah, part it's, or it's, better part of a like, church? Yeah, it was like a way. It's kind of like we teach about the sacrament now. It was a way to cleanse your sins after you had done bad things, and to kind of renew your covenants with God. Huh. That sounds so much like Warren Jeffs. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to rack my brain around this and, re and try to remember if maybe things like that were taught in the FLDS growing up. I don't recall, but I can understand why followers of Warren Jeffs would now look at that and say, "Well, it was done back in Brigham Young's day, so what's wrong with it?" So, wow, no, I had no idea. Yeah, my understanding, and I'm I'm just I just uh, I just kind of Googled. Quora and Quora, there's a question on Quora. Why did Brigham Young require that all members of the LDS church be baptized again after Joseph Smith? So, I mean, apparently, um, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, th there's an answer. This was part of the Mormon Reformation that occurred between 1856 and 1857. So, so basically, there was a thing called the Mormon Reformation that happened in the mid 1850s that Brigham Young was a part of. And, you know, people have to study why it was that Brigham taught everyone they needed to get rebaptized. But this, there's very little that Warren Jeffs did 
that 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 he didn't learn from either Joseph Smith or Brigham Young. Well, and was it Brigham Young's way of um, getting people's loyalty since there was a split clear back then between the RLDS and the LDS? Well, maybe it was. That's that. how Warren treated it because every time someone like Joanna had been rebaptized, like there was multiple times, and each time it was the elite or the um, exceptional members, the people who are truly followers of Warren Jess, mm -hmm. that were able to be baptized yep. again into basically like the next tier, the next level of membership. Um, and it was this constant, like, you guys are worthy to be members again. So I'm, it sounds very, very similar, yeah. like eerily similar. I wonder if it was just to, to, to show their allegiance to him, allegiance to him. And after the split, uh, after Joseph Smith died, because there was a split at that point. So maybe it was, okay, if you still believe and follow the church, then you need to be rebaptized re into it. I wonder, I wonder if that's where that came from. Rebaptized into Brigham Young's church. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing he just wanted everyone to recommit. I mean, there had been mm -hmm. the schism where, where the reorganized church was emerging. Emma was claiming mm -hmm. that, that that Joseph Smith the third was the was the true successor, and I'm guessing at a very base core psychological level, Brigham was like, "Hey, man, this is my church now, and I want everyone to recommit to me and my church. Um, if if you're gonna kind of if you're gonna stay with us." Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So Sorry, Edith, side note, <laughs> side little <laughs> sidebar. So Edith was rebaptized at 17. We don't know why. She was the domestic help. She married William in 1886. So so four years before the manifesto, but while the church was under heavy, heavy persecution, fleeing federal, you know, law enforcement agents, um, right before the manifesto. So it must have been a really dangerous time. For him to enter into this third marriage he was married in the logan temple but there's no record of the marriage i mentioned that earlier that's likely because they needed to make it secret and then after they married they moved to oregon to escape arrest right mm -hmm. um eventually edith became close with clarissa and uh, as i mentioned uh she took on clarissa's son marcus when clarissa died which means she had four teenage boys at her home at once that she was raising. Wow. She died in 1825 of cancer at age 57. So again, a relatively young death, yeah. right? Yeah. But on the other hand, she was the one that William lived with in the final years. Let's just say the final 10 to 20 years of his life. And so she got the best, uh, she got the best of all the three of all the four wives Edith got the best. Yeah. Interesting. So, so yeah, um, a couple reflections on Edith that were interesting. Um, so, uh, so let's see. Um, Edith took in her son Marcus. Uh, that's that's Clarissa's son. Edith took in Clarissa's son Marcus, which with Fred, Jack, and Ben gave her four teenage boys at home. William lived uh, just with Edith. Karma writes, this is my, my grandma, I often wondered how my mother even survived those days with all that big family and four big boys who are full of life and always getting into mischief with nothing much to do but loaf around. Because they didn't live on the farm. These were, we, these were the sons of a wealthy doctor who mm -hmm. didn't live on a farm, right? Yeah. And then it says one day Mark, Fred, and Jack all came home drunk, which I thought was interesting. She sent them all upstairs to sober up and lock the door. I thought they would knock the house down. <laughs> well, that's kind of funny, right? Oh, yeah. Moments like that, I just I love when you read past things and realize that like people are people and kids are kids. You know, those moments of just like relating to things and you're like, Man, boys back in the day are the same as what you'd think of if there was a house full of teenage boys now and kind of bring back to home that there's this connection that, yeah. you know, time doesn't matter as much except, sometimes. Except maybe dad was living in Oregon. So Edith's got, I mean, who, know, who knows? Maybe he was off with his fourth wife. So like Edith was left probably a lot of times to raise these children without the dad around, right? Uh, I mean, imagine it seemed racing, like he wasn't around much at all. Yeah, with imagine any raising wives. four teenage boys with no with no fatherly support. Right. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. 
Well, I that thought that was enough. a fun and an interesting story. Yeah. Um, another thing that's kind of sad, uh, this was just, this is kind of pandemic history because now in 2022, there's still a global flu pandemic going on. This came out of the history, quote, when the, when the flu epidemic hit in 1919, William worked day and night. Those were terrible days. Every day someone called to tell mother of the death of some dear friend or relative. We had to wear masks over our faces if we went into public places. And then it got so bad that all schools and places of entertainment were closed. People who were well enough uh, were asked to go into homes and help those who were stricken. Um, so this is this is Edith's children, Karma's siblings. So Karma writes, my half-sister Alice, so this would have been another mom's children. My half-sister Alice was expecting a baby, and she was stricken and was buried with her baby, leaving a little boy. That spring, Edith's son Ben died of the flu at age 57. He had been a medical student at the University of Utah and was known for his baritone singing voice. They were planning to record his voice, which was a new thing at the time. We couldn't attend. Uh, we couldn't have a funeral. Friends came in the house one at a time to view the remains and stood on the lawn while we held a short service with the speakers on the front porch and our friends and relatives standing on the lawn. William wore himself out treating flu patients, and he took the deaths of his children hard. He himself succumbed to the flu and never recovered, dying of complications 14 months later on November 9th, 1920. So wow. clearly the, the pandemic was deadly to many of William's children um, and, uh, and, and some of Edith's own children. And we just see whether it's the masks or the cancellation of events or the multiple deaths, we see that my great grandparents and, and, and grandma experienced a way worse version of the COVID pandemic that we just have lived through over the past two or three years. And that's an interesting thing about studying your history is you'll find that history repeats itself. And I didn't realize that my direct uh, ancestors, uh, Many of them died from a pandemic, just like we experienced. I, I was going to say, when you first started reading this, I thought, wow, is this yeah. 2020 or what? Exactly, <laughs> it sounds right? the exact same. 1920. Wow. Literally a hundred years later. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, insane. And, and it was a, and, and it had, there had, has not been a pandemic, a flu pandemic that was global between 1920 and 20, you know, 19, 2020. And so it's a hundred years and it just happens to touch our family wow. in two different ways. So that's kind of interesting, right? Yeah. Wow. Very and tragic, right? Oh yeah. yes, definitely. And Watch this out. Ends up, this ends up being what kills William, right? Uh -huh. later, yeah. later. So hmm. leaving the wives again permanently. I mean, they'd already been through so, so we're, much. We're all, were all of his wives uh, alive at this point when he died? Uh, actually we're going to get to that. So when did the fourth wife, the fourth wife died in 1913. So no, his fourth wife dies seven years before, before. the pandemic and, and oh. seven years before he died. But that's for me, I've, I've mentioned several dark moments. Um, the fourth wife is for me, the darkest of all. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Um, hmm. uh, I've already read to you Edith's account of, why she loved polygamy. Mm -hmm. So I, we don't necessarily need to read it again, but I, I have it repeating here that Edith says the reason why she loved polygamy was because she was going to be sitting in the celestial kingdom with her dad and with God while the rest of her 35 siblings won't. And I just felt like that's a crappy reason to say you love polygamy. Right. And so we don't mm -hmm. need to repeat that, but, um, Okay, so you would think that he, that he would be sad, William would be satisfied with Edith, especially given that Edith married him only a few years, you know, before the manifesto. So they were married four years before the manifesto, running from the law as fugitives. You think he'd be happy with three wives, <laughs> wouldn't you? Are they ever? 
No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <I'll never. laughs> but no, um, William marries a fourth wife. And her mm. name was Margaret Wallace Sloan Parkinson Shaw. So she had a lot of names. Wow. Um, but really, she was known as Margaret Wallace Sloan. And, um, and so she was, she was born in England. Mary, she was born to Edward and Mary Wallace Sloan. Uh, I think they were Scottish. They came to Utah. Her dad, Edward Sloan, wrote the hymn for the strength of the hills. Oh, wow. He was an editor for the Millennial Star. So he was an educated, Af, you know, influential early Mormon pioneer. He eventually became the editor of the Deseret News and the founder of a competing newspaper later called the Salt Lake Daily Herald. He was the co-founder of a progressive publication called the Women's Exponent, um, which is kind of cool. Um, and interestingly, there's an account that says that Margaret's dad didn't like the idea of Margaret marrying William because William was a polygamist, but her dad was also a polygamist. And we don't huh. even know if she knew that her dad was a polygamist while he's objecting to polygamy. So that's a big question mark. That's super weird and fascinating, right? I wonder if at that point, uh, some, the leaders of the church were starting to say, okay, so those that still practice polygamy continue on, but we're no longer longer going to allow more marriages, maybe. Maybe that was around that time, and that's why her dad was not really agreeing with it. I, I'm not sure, but I know that that, that, that time did come. Yeah, because I guess if he was a faithful believing Mormon in the in the prophet and believing that the manifesto was inspired and not just some trick to get the government off of you know off of their uh, yeah off of their case, if he actually believed that that manifesto was revelation, then I can see where he'd be like, uh, I don't want you to get into a polygamous relationship now, or maybe it was for her safety too. You know, if they're going to run from the law from his last marriage and it's post manifesto now, it could have been purely for the safety of his daughter. Or yeah, yeah, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Keep no, going. I was just going to say, or maybe as a polygamist himself, he saw what some of the women went through, and he didn't want that for his daughter. Totally, it could have been as simple as that. Totally, I love that analysis. And by the way, if 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 it's true that Edward Sloan, after the manifesto, was rightly opposed to his daughter entering into a polygamous marriage, why was William okay? marrying two years after the manifesto was issued. What was it that made William, who would have known that the church told the world, hey, we're not doing polygamy anymore. What was my effing great-grandfather doing marrying his fourth wife two years after the, the man he worshipped as a prophet, seer, and revelator, or sustained as a prophet, seer, and revelator? What was he doing marrying his fourth wife after the man he sustained as a prophet, seer, and revelator had told the world that the church was going to no longer practice polygamy. What was up with that, mm -hmm. William? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, William. Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be the new saying. New saying for the rest of Yeah, William. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th this is all dark and weird and sketchy. And it's one thing that I was never taught about post-manifesto polygamy, right? Well, it was one thing that I was never really taught about polygamy. It was another thing that even once I learned about polygamy, I wasn't taught about post-manifesto polygamy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then it was another thing to be taught about post-manifesto polygamy. But then it's even weirder to find out that my own great-grandfather and great-grandmother were involved in post-manifesto polygamy. It's just yeah. super disturbing that this was a deceptive, illegal act upon other deceptions and, and illegalities. And it's all in my family line, you know? Well, and it's one thing when they're like lying for the Lord, like pre post manifesto, like you said, but then when they're going against what the prophet's saying, it's like, where does that even leave them? If you're not doing it because the prophet's telling you to, then where, are you, where are you religiously anyway? And when you lose the religious piece of it and you don't have that, you know, at least there's some kind of defense if you say, oh, I'm doing this for religious reasons and I'm doing it for a higher law. I'm doing it for God's law. But when that's no longer God's law anymore and he's taking that law away. 
you like you don't even have the excuse anymore. Well, it gets tricky here though because though Wilfred Woodruff signed the manifesto, there are a lot of people that will talk about the fact that he was still very much pro polygamy. He said, this is what Joseph Smith taught. This is what Brigham Young taught. This is what uh, John Taylor taught. This is a celestial law. He himself practicing polygamy as well. So it wasn't until a couple prophets later that they said, okay, we're done. We're completely cutting ties with polygamous um, marriages. So that it gets a little tricky. Maybe William was elite or thought in his mind that he was one of the most elite to be able to continue to do it. Or for all we know, Wilford Woodruff himself could have told him, oh, no, you're okay. It's okay. In my mind, there's no way the Mormon, like, like William was married to his fourth wife, Margaret, in the endowment house. Uh, y y um, where does it say it? Um, yeah. So, um, well, I, I just, there's no way in my mind that the, that the prophet of the church would, Wilford Woodruff or the, or the subsequent prophet Lorenzo Snow, there's no way in my mind they didn't know polygamy was going on. They knew they were hiding it. They were lying about it. They approved it. They sanctioned it, but they kept it secret. They sent people to Mexico and Canada to keep practicing it after the manifesto. And that's why I think the fundamentalists, have a legitimate claim that they were started by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They're not an offshoot. They're like a secret, they're a secret society. They're kind of were a secret cult within a cult, basically. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. Uh, the, the group sent to Colorado City, uh, Colorado Hilldale Short Creek area, was actually people following the prophet's direct order. And I, I, I forget if it was uh, Wilford Woodruff or Lorenzo Snow, one of them, uh, actually encouraged a group of these people that were still practicing polygamy to move to Shore Creek because it was kind of out of the way and hidden. So, so they were encouraged. They yes. were encouraged to become that group, not meant to have it be as much of a split off as what it became. So it wasn't until I believe Joseph F. Smith that completely said we are no longer going to associate with polygamy that the FLDS was then separated from the mainstream church. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So apparently Margaret marries William in Manti. At least that's what the records say. It's some reports say she was the only one who was legally married to him. Mm -hmm. Um, like, like, which was weird because I would have thought it would always be the first wife that would be married. We talked about this at the beginning, but then other reports have the first wife, um, Elizabeth being divorced and a divorce would imply that there was an originally a marriage. Um, but but it, it looks as though um, Margaret was legally married um, to hmm. William. Um, and, and so that's weird. And then the other thing that makes this super tragic is that they struggled to have children. There's, re there's a report of two stillborn boys. Hmm. Um, but then there were three girls who were born, but then there's a report that two of the, two of the three girls died in 1900. So mm -hmm. of the five children that they had, four died, two were stillborn, two died in 1900. One was, one was four and one was seven. Um, and, and, and then Luis was the only living child of the four. Um, and um, I will just also say that there's this really disturbing report that comes from the descendants. I'll just read it. Um, one of the descendants wrote, the fourth wife came from a fine family in Salt Lake and she still had a brother living. Her health wasn't good. I used to like to go to her place because she had the most beautiful flowers. The place was lovely. She had everything growing. She had almost a whole big yard of peonies. She left and went to Oregon. She was sick, and they took her up there to take care of her. I went down there in my little wagon and dug up the those peony bulbs and brought them home and planted them. So there's, there's one account of her being sickly, of her going to Oregon, which kind of like begs the question, why was she sick? Why did she go to Oregon? What happened? 
And then there's a little bit more. So a little bit, another report writes, William and Margaret were later estranged and Margaret, who had health problems, went to live in Oregon. Edith's health also de deteriorated as she aged. So again, why were they estranged, right? Why were William and Margaret estranged? Why did Margaret have health problems? And then I did a little more digging, and here's what I found. Sylvia, which is a granddaughter of Margaret, writes, you mentioned someone, S Sylvia, uh, sorry, someone asked Clara, who is a granddaughter of um, Margaret and William, Sylvia writes, you mentioned also that somehow she became addicted to laudanum. So now what we're learning is that the fourth wife, Margaret, at some point in the story, got addicted to an opiate. And what Clara mm -hmm. writes, and this is the, the granddaughter, Clara writes, it's an opium derivative as far as I know. She had so much problem with her children. My mother, so this is Margaret, for instance, no, sorry, my mother, um, which is Margaret's daughter, uh, got whooping cough, the red measles, and what we know now as a staph infection. She got that all at the same time, and before she got over that, she pulled a pan of boiling water over on her and burned herself. So I'm sorry, I'm confusing this a little bit, but Margaret, while she was raising these three daughters, Two of them with, I believe, is scarlet, what, what do we say, scarlet fever. She's raising these three daughters, likely alone. While she's raising them, one of the daughters got the red measles, had a staph infection. Margaret's boiling some water, and she pulled a pan of boiling water over onto herself and burned herself. Then it goes on to say, her children were all very, very ill through this period of time. I think that's what killed the baby, the whooping cough, and these diseases. Mm -hmm. So she was just so ill trying to take care of the children that her nerves gave out on her, and apparently she was going to have a nervous breakdown, and so they gave her some laudanum to soothe her nerves and calm her down apparently she became addicted to it. Now I'm going to ask you guys, where in the world would she have gotten her laudanum? <laughs> her opiates. Remember that I, photo of William? Uh, Remember yeah. what he was in front of? Yeah. It was, that was my daughter's thing. I'm like, who has access to that? Oh, but of course her, her husband. husband was a doctor. Yeah. I was like, no yeah. other women in that time probably even had access to opioids like that was not no a idea i can't imagine that being that common back then right to have access to that and so i don't want to give like a worst case you know uncharitable interpretation but what i'm piecing together is that william does what he does which is he runs off marries an underage girl starts having a bunch of babies with her but by now is he in is he in germany is he in France? Is he off doing his postdocs? Is he off studying in Chicago for his postgraduate work? He's leaving Margaret behind with a bunch of young kids. They're all getting sick again. He's a doctor saving the world, but his own kids are dying of diseases. While his wife, Margaret, has no help from William, she pulls boiling water down on herself. Two of her three kids die after having another two that were stillborn. She develops this chronic pain. He medicates her with opiates. She develops an opiate addiction. And we don't really know what led to her eventually moving to Oregon. But what we read later on, and this is the final quote that was super dark and disturbing. One of her descendants, Sylvia, someone asks, did your mother ever say, why her mother ended up in Portland, Oregon. So this is Clara, Margaret's daughter, um, being asked, why did Margaret go to Oregon? Clara's answer was, I think to get as far away from grandfather as she could. Whoa. So Margaret, be 
grew to hate William, became estranged from him, and then moved to Oregon by one account to get as far away as she could. I mean, wow. isn't that disturbing? Like, it's just so sad. Every single, I mean, every single account just, it's so sad. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even have like words for it at this point going through the fourth, the fourth story. And it's just heartbreaking. Yeah. I mean, I know that uh, a lot of people have very difficult marriages, but man, it's, uh, I think that, I think that if uh, you're going to marry a woman as a man, you need to give her all of your attention and, <laughs> and time and make sure that the kids are well taken care of. So this is very disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like presentism aside, women in the 1800s and early 1900s needed their husbands just like women do now. Mm -hmm. And children mm -hmm. needed their dad in the late 1800s or early 1900s, just like they do now. Presentism doesn't account for this level of, of abusive neglect that Margaret Wallace Sloan experienced and her children experienced in a Mormon marriage to prominent, affluent, educated, wealthy William, you know, William Parkinson, right? My great grandpa. Yeah. Um, so this is a super tragic story. That's super dark. And of course, Margaret's forgotten about, of course, one of Edith's grandchildren says that, that, that William ended up with her, with, with his last wife, Edith, because the fourth wife, Margaret was completely forgotten because that was such a tragic story. Who would want to pass that story down to generations? Right. And of course my mom knew nothing of the fourth wife. And of course, karma never mentioned, you know, his, his, her mom, Margaret, because who wants to pass down and remember this story? Right. Yeah. Well, not only that, yeah. but I mean, technically out of the four wives, the first wife, at least from what we, you know, with our investigative, uh, <laughs> Our investigative time here has been, it seems like the first wife, whether she asked for the divorce or not, she wanted to get away from him, right? Or would it seems that that was the case. Yeah, they're, and they're then the, estranged and divorced for sure. Estranged and divorced, right? And yeah. then the fourth wife wants to get away from him. So he really only like at the end of everything, he only had two wives and one of them died young at 45. Clarissa and so died young and, and, and yeah, having spent almost no time with him. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So Edith being the only one who really has posterity to even really talk about him, isn't very surprising at all. When you see yeah. how these other, yeah, that the other women were trying to get away from him, not just, not just purely forgotten, but wanting to be separated from him. Yeah. And let me do, let me do one, one quick, one quick correction there. Because m several of Elizabeth Bull, the first wife, several of her children ended up becoming doctors and, and physicians. I think wow. the children of Elizabeth and Clarissa ended up doing quite well because their dad was a prominent doctor. So oh, I, okay. so I, so I, many, many, many of the children ended up affluent and respectable from the first, second and third wives. So I don't want to leave an impression that that didn't happen. But certainly the children of the first wife, Elizabeth, are, you know, by, by the time it hits the grandchildren, they're like, yeah, granddad divorced grandma, you know, and, and mm -hmm. they were, they were estranged. So anyway, slight, slight correction there, but otherwise, absolutely. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Were you going to say something, Sam? About no, I was just saying fascinating, fascinating uh, information and history that you, you were able to gather up with such little information out there. The fact that you were able to gather so much up is, in, is uh, encouraging me to want to try to put together something with a little bit more information about my family as well. Because I mean, I don't have to go far to find polygamy, polygamy in my <laughs> in my heritage, uh, but growing up in that way, there's still so much to uncover and so much I would like to know about feelings and kind of the way that uh, everything, the the way that my family actually felt about polygamy, not just what I saw. Yeah, yeah, that's that's why. Like, I it's weird because I feel like I have the spirit of Elijah. Mormons call spirit of the light. Mormons call a passion for genealogy the spirit of Elijah. 
and oddly as a, as an excommunicated ex Mormon number one enemy, you know, the church calls me their number one enemy in the world. Like now I've got as an ex Mormon apostate, I've caught the spirit of Elijah and I'm learning all these things about my, about my ancestors. Really quickly, wow. something cool about Margaret is that once she moves to Oregon, apparently she became a writer to help support herself. And she wrote some articles for Cosmopolitan magazine. Hmm. She was a pro prolific writer, which makes sense because her dad was an editor of the Desert News. Um, and then it goes on to say that her dad, um, ultimately after he left the Desert News, became the publisher and editor of Salt Lake Herald Journal. And that sometimes he wrote articles against the Mormon church, even though he was an active member of the Mormon church. So I, I have some other apostate sort of anti-Mormons in my ancestry because I'm sure Margaret's dad ended up hating polygamy and hating aspects of Mormon polygamy. And so it would make sense that he might publish articles against the church, right? Especially yeah. the way his daughter was treated by her by her husband, right? Right. Yeah. So look at that. Progressive Mormons in John DeLynn's ancestry. My, my ancestry, yeah. <laughs> um, uh yeah. So one other quote that was just super bizarre out of left field is if we haven't seen enough shocking things related to Margaret, one of Margaret's descendants, this is a, this is a, a dialogue between a Sylvia and a Clara. So Sylvia says, okay, is there anything else you can remember either about your mother or your grandmother? So I think this is Clara. This is Margaret's granddaughter, Clara. So Clara writes, well, I think going back to Margaret Louise Sloan, my grandmother, I think there was quite a bit of conflict between her brothers and her husband, Dr. William Brigham Parkinson. I know that mother told me once that Uncle Ed and Uncle Bob threatened to horsewhip grandfather if he didn't have my grandmother sealed to him. Oh, wow. What do you guys make of that? Well, I mean, like you said earlier, if she was actually married civilly and they, I mean, the whole purpose for polygamy from the very beginning has been behind the, that it's about the ceiling, right? It's about being able to be in the celestial kingdom and have that eternal salvation and be to the highest degree of glory. And so when you see any time where that part of it's not being fulfilled, any true believing Mormon at that time or even now, like that's the whole point. And if they're not going to do that, then even back then the brothers are like, well, then you're up to something not good. Like that's the whole point. So if you're practicing polygamy without that portion, then what's the point and why are you doing it? Yeah. Then it makes it seem like he just wanted to have another woman in his home instead of actually fulfilling the, the whole purpose of it. Like you said. Yeah. yeah. If this is, if this account is right, that William married Margaret legally, but was not sealed to her and had to be threatened with being horse whipped to get sealed to her. What in the crap was William doing marrying a fourth wife legally after the manifesto? And by the way, he met that divorce that he got from Elizabeth. It's possible that he had to divorce Elizabeth to then marry Margaret uh. legally what in the crap was he doing marrying Margaret legally, but not in the temple? What in the crap? If anything, it should have hmm. been the other way around. Right. You know, for, for those who aren't as familiar that like the ceiling is the important part. The, I mean, who cares about the law at this point anyway, right? Like they're all criminals. They're all going against the law. It should be only God's law that matters at this point. So you think that all they would care about is the ceiling, which is what normally happens is the, the civil union with the first wife. And then all the rest are only sealed because that's the important part of polygamy. The other part, the civil marriage doesn't matter at all. Right. Why would that law matter out of all of them? It makes no sense. <laughs> hmm. And then again, this kind of shows how, how Margaret's life ended. You know, I, you know, my mother, Louise, this is the daughter of Margaret. My, my mother, Louise was very protective of her mother, Margaret. I know when she got older, she was more concerned about being with her mother than being with my dad. I think she got senile and didn't remember daddy as much as she did her own mother, which is usually what happens in circumstances like this. And mm -hmm. so Margaret basically dies 
senile, right? Wow. Dies with four of her five children dying, one child remaining, addicted to opiates, and senile. That's basically <laughs> how life ends for Margaret and totally forgotten, right? And yeah. uh, that's why I call Margaret the darkest of all these accounts. Wow. You know? Yeah. Um, so that's in summary, and I've, I've, I've got just a little bit more, but like in summary, that's, that's the legacy of polygamy and William Brigham Parkinson. First wife, you know, estranged, divorced, left her last six years blind and diabetic without a husband around. Clarissa Taggart dies young, uh, you know, having never spent any meaningful time with her husband, William. Edith, who who got the most of William, but even Edith couldn't keep William around because he runs off with, with Margaret eventually. And then Margaret, who doesn't last, what, seven, ten years with William and ends up being estranged from him and wanting to move as far away from him as she possibly could, loathing him, dying senile. That is the legacy of polygamy with my great-grandfather, William Brigham Parkinson. Poof. And you know, it's so... I mean, obviously, hearing the story is like... It's heartbreaking in so many different ways for these women. But I also can't help but think, as you were saying at the beginning, if people were looking into their polygamous heritage and truly looking at the stories of these women, I it makes me sad to say, but I would also guess that your grandmothers were not the only women who had lives like this. Oh, no. Oh, no. You know? And so I'm just super grateful that you were willing to look this up and, like you said, give these women names let people know a little bit more about them and their legacy and what they went through because for them, they were just doing the best that they could with the situation they were in, in something that they believed, hoping for eternal salvation and for a happy life on the other side after going through the crappy lives that they were dealt, you know, and they were just doing the best that they could and they deserve to be recognized. So we're just super grateful you were willing to put this together and and come and tell us so that we could tell yes. and share their stories. Fascinating, fascinating story. Well, you guys have been super patient and I'm honored that anyone would care. Listen, <laughs> I just want to share with you some excerpts from William's obituary because it, it really does put like a demented twist on all this. Is that all right? If I just share a couple things, sure. of course. So, so I'm reading from William, you know, Brigham Parkinson's obituary. I'll just read a couple excerpts. So when they're talking about his, you know, early years, it, it writes after suffering much abuse from his stepmother, the lad ran away from home the same year he was adopted by John W. Chapman of Helen, Elena, Helena, Montana, who cared for and partially educated him until he was 15 years of age. And thereafter he became the architect of his own fortunes and destiny. How well he succeeded is attested by his achievements and excellent reputation as a physician, as husband, father, citizen, and member of the church. So that was, you know, one excerpt of the obituary where I'm like, oh, as <laughs> husband and father. I mean, and again, maybe he was by his day's standard an exemplary husband and father, but like, Certainly, that's a problematic way to characterize his life as, as an exemplary, excellent example of a husband and father, given what we know about the egregious neglect of the children and of at least two of four marriages being objective failures, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that does pose the question that in that time and age, as a member of the Mormon church, what were the parameters of being a good husband and father? Was being a good husband meaning being a plural husband? Is that what constituted excellent? Excellence means multiple wives, having at least three wives. And being a good father means literally just fathering children. And so that it's poses the question. Like serving in the church, bringing yep. honor to the church, having lots of babies for the church. And, and living plural marriage. Of, making a bunch of money for the church and, 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 and living the church's doctrines, which is polygamy 
that's what defined a, a good person back then, right? Yep. yep, that's yep, that's exactly what I'm well, saying. <laughs> for a father to be there for his wives and to be there for his children wasn't the highest of priorities for the church, obviously. As you can see that he was sent away on a mission after having a, a wives and having children. So I can see that, you know, if you're looking at it from the church's lenses, that that would, that he did a great job. He did everything that the church expected of him, exactly. right? Exactly. And Sam, this reminds me of my, my interview with you, because I remember asking you if you really ever had any heart to hearts with your dad, how well you really knew him. And I, I was expecting that you would say, oh yeah, there's the time we went fishing and there's the time we, you know, he took me on this trip and we really bonded. But by my recollection of you, you don't ever remember any real one-on-one -on -one time with your dad. No, it was uh, normally in a setting of several several of us children or the whole family. Yes, it was. Uh, we did do, we did go on certain trips and things like that, but it was never a one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And so both in the FLDS church and in the Mormon church, it has never really meant, a good father has never really meant meeting the emotional and psychological needs of your children. Hmm. That's never been part of the equation. Maybe the temporal needs, maybe, and, and, and maybe having the children and serving in the church and giving the church a right, the kids a righteous example of church service, but meeting the emotional and the psychological needs of the children has never been in the equation of what it means to be a good father within any form of Mormonism that I'm aware of. When you use the word righteous, that was what came to my mind. Being a righteous example, being a righteous priesthood holder and honoring priesthood was always the main thing I would think of if someone was to say, what is the most important thing about being a father? And yeah, that didn't necessarily, um, you know, I knew lots of people that definitely respected their fathers that had high callings. And that did not mean that they were going to have a super close relationship. Not that there was abuse or anything. Um, but I mean, as far as relationships go, yeah, being that good example definitely was the main priority over anything else and showing that you were honoring your priesthood and raising your children in righteousness, right? Or showing them the example of how to be was always more important than, yeah, any of kids' feelings. <laughs> totally, totally. So, so something else from the obituary that I thought was super interesting, there's a really obvious a, a, to me, um, effort uh, to deceive in, in this obituary. And you guys can tell me if I've got this wrong. So in the obituary, it writes, for the doctor, following the tenets of his religion, this would have been written in 1920, right, when he died. So this, is, this would have been 30 years after the manifesto, right? Mm -hmm. For the doctor, following the tenets of his religion, before the issuance of the manifesto had married four wives <laughs> his first married in 1873 so follow me with the years his first married in 1873 miss elizabeth bull and then he lists a bunch of children and then it goes on two years later so it's giving a year what's the year it's giving yeah, that one is, what are we, 1873, 1873, then 1875. So two years later, it's giving a year, 1875, he married Miss Clarissa Taggart of Morgan, deceased. Then he lists the children. And then wife number three, on January 27th, 1886, mm -hmm. he married Miss Edith Benson, right? And then it goes yeah. on to list all the children and, and, and everything they've done. And then here's... Here's the kicker. His fourth wife, which I'm surprised they married, they mentioned at all, frankly, knowing how her life ended, right? And the fact that they were completely estranged. His fourth wife, which they don't mention was estranged. And by the way, did they mention that that Elizabeth was divorced? No, they didn't mention that. But anyway, his fourth wife, what do they leave out? A date. They leave out a date. So they mm -hmm. claim that it was a that it was a, a, a marriage before the manifesto. But when they mention the fourth wife, they conspicuously leave out a date. And they say his fourth wife was Miss Margaret Sloan, deceased. 
whose only surviving child is, you know, Miss A. R. Rallison. Two children preceded her to the beyond. So th to me, that that showed just outright deception, right? What do you guys think about that? Am I overblowing that? No. I mean, it's deception. I also find it very, like, not surprising in an obituary, right? Because when someone yeah. dies, everyone's only going to talk about the positives. They're going to hold someone on a high pedestal, but whether they deserve it or not, because you never want to talk bad about the dead. So I'm also not surprised at all that they would leave that out or at 1920 that they would hide the fact that he had had yeah. these other polygamous relationships. Yeah. And that's every, every funeral ever. <laughs> like, uh, you know, you just, you don't talk bad about the people who have died. You don't yeah. bring up their dirty laundry. You just word it in a way that you can say the nice things that you can and you leave out any facts that are going to make them sound bad. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so here's how the obituary ends, which again is disturbing to me, but it's understandable. It is a tribute to Dr. Parkinson's ability that he was able to support and educate so numerous a family it doesn't mention how important the wives were in actually educating and raising the children, but he was able to support and educate so numerous a family, but he succeeded admirably and raised them to be reputable citizens and members of his church. And in raising this family, he developed the highest and best traits of a husband and father. <laughs> and again, two failed marriages. So much children, child neglect. The kids survived because of their moms and the dad's financial support. But but he's being heralded as a model husband and father with 50% of his marriages being objective failures. He's being heralded with the best traits of a husband. And I don't <laughs> hate the guy. I'm sure he had good traits. But, I mean, isn't that a dark way to describe the end of his life a little bit does it say does it say who wrote his obituary because typically uh, it's a wife right but all of his wives were deceased before him is that correct no no edith was still so uh, his fourth wife was also still alive no right? no no. his fourth died, died his fourth died, died. no yeah you're right his fourth sure. wife died before for him. sure no I but think, some of them were still alive i thought i think that maybe elizabeth outlived him oh was died. it elizabeth but she wouldn't have written his yeah. obituary. Elizabeth I was just died curious. Two years after, but she, yeah, she wouldn't have. I'm guessing it was one of his doctor sons, right? Mm. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking. I'm like, I'm just curious. I, when you read that, you're like, okay, so whose lens is this through, too? Yeah. Because while while obviously nobody's going to talk poorly about the dead, I mean, that's very. But you got to also wonder um, if this was somebody like w in the church that was doing it, and so they're bringing it from their perspective. Or if it was a child who, you know, like you said, was supported and the children probably were okay through this process. It's well, really the, the wives. The, that oftentimes, suffer. yes, exactly. Oftentimes the children are kind of kept away from the truth because they don't, the, the parents don't want the children to suffer because of what they're going through. Uh, so I, I can I could totally see a lot of the children being kept from a lot of what was going on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I don't mean to demonize the guy. And let me say something positive about him because I'm sure <laughs> he was an amazing guy, like really a good man in many ways. Um, it goes on. It goes on to say um, in the obituary, a graduate of Rush and Louisville Schools of Medicine with postgraduate work. Blah blah blah. Um, the doctor kept in the van of his profession and loved his art not so much for its monetary rewards as for the opportunities it afforded for helping humanity for the doctor although a surgeon was not a shylock to demand his pound of flesh from nearest the heart no major operation had to await the raising of the fee before it was performed nor in his little private hospital were patients denied until the fee was forthcoming so apparently he had a reputation, according to the obituary, of providing his medical services, even if people couldn't afford to pay. And it goes on, the, the family home never had to be mortgaged to guarantee his fee. Um, so he, apparently he gave discounts to many of his patients for the doctor had a heart that beat for humanity. So who knows? He probably was a charitable, kind guy. 
um, in many ways. And then it goes on to say he had gone for surely he has gone to his sure reward. I do wonder if he got the second anointing. That was just a, something that I kind of wondered. Um, but just, just if you don't, if you, if you think that dirty laundry is, is not, um, to be seen in obituaries, you can see that women can be thrown under the bus because it describes his childhood. It says, while the foregoing gives the main features in his life history, there have been various other things which have led to the shaping his career. Left an orphan at the age of 10, he suffered abuse at the hands of a stepmother and ran away from home, after which he was bound out. So the, woman, the stepmom, even though she had lost her husband and was left this orphan, it's okay to throw the stepmom under the bus in the obituary, basically. Well, because that's the story of how he was able to be self-made. So great, you know, right? It's part of it's yeah, it's part of that's his why he's so great. story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And there was another obituary I found later that actually described him as a man with only one wife, and the three wives and the rest of the kids were actually completely left. Oh wow! Which wife it's was like, it? Uh, th in this case, they mentioned Elizabeth Bull, and they left oh. out. The other three wives. The other three. Interesting. Probably that one may have been written by uh, one of Elizabeth's children. I don't know. And maybe. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then, of course, they mentioned his career and, and all sorts of other things. So, anyway, every, you guys have been super patient. Everyone else has been really <laughs> patient. I put one sl slide together to kind of summarize my takeaways in terms of, like, my concerns about polygamy after reading my family's heritage. And I mean, no disrespect to my ancestors. I love them and I'm proud of them. And I'm, I'm sure if I'd met them, I'm sure in many ways they were better men and women than me, but I'll say this. I think polygamy was good for good for the husbands in the sense that they were able to pursue careers and education and, and gain power and money and influence um, so overall, polygamy was good for the husbands. There was a lot of sex and money and status and power wrapped up in that. I would say it was mixed for the children because I do think the children in many ways benefited from, from the, the lives that they lived. Many of my, many of William's children went on to become wealthy doctors and physicians and people of, of status and money. So if your dad has chosen to have polygamy and if he makes a ton of money and gets a bunch of status because he's favorited by the, the, the church or the cult, then many of the children will benefit from that. I say it's bad for the women. The wives were egregiously neglected, died way too early, had, had relatively horrible lives, even though they told everyone it was a wonderful life. I, I think it was not a wonderful life. And I think it was tragic that some wives get favored over others because that leaves other wives to be less favored and to be estranged. And in my case, there were at least two estranged. In this case, there were at least two estranged wives. And I see that as tragic and as abusive. So overall, polygamy was what I call a Potemkin town. Potemkin towns were these towns, I guess, in, in, in early communist Russia, or maybe it was pre, you know, um, uh, you know, pre pre communist Russia, where the the czars would have these dilapidated, awful towns, but they would have visitors come to the towns, and they wanted to make the towns look good, and so or, along the main street they would put up these facades on the houses to make the houses look beautiful, to make them look affluent and wealthy, but it was just the the faces the facades of the house, the visitors to the towns weren't allowed to go behind the houses, weren't able to go off the main street. And these were called Potemkin villages or Potemkin towns where the face looked beautiful, the appearance looked good, but what, what was behind the scene was tragic. And I'm calling early Mormon polygamy a, 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 a metaphorical Potemkin town with a positive face, but with a dark, hidden underbelly. And then finally, I'm going to say it was good for the church because these men paid a crap ton of tithing, were able to get educated, make a bunch of money, bring the church a bunch of money, power, wealth, and status. 
and and the church benefited, um, but it was at the expense of the wives and the women. So that's my summary of what I learned from my research of of, of Mormon polygamy and my ancestry. Wow. <sighs> wow. Thank you so <laughs> yes. much, John. Oh, my word. I mean, that's just... Yeah, you've really inspired at least me, and I'm sure there are so many of our viewers that um, are feeling inspired and are going to want to go find out more of their family history. Um, not just, you know, obviously it's the sad portion, right? Like there's a sad element to it of finding out um, things about your ancestors that aren't positive or aren't the way that you would hope to think of of the people that um, are your ancestry, but really being able to honor those people that um, maybe didn't get the honor that they deserved in this life. Right. You know, I think that that's wonderful and beautiful. And like you said, definitely worth the time and the effort to get to know them, to tell their stories. And we're just grateful that you were willing to come do that and uh, share that with them and share what it was like for them to grow up in polygamy. Yes. Wow. Seriously. Thank you so much for your insight and uh, all this information. Uh, to be completely honest, I am, I, I, I want to go sit down right now. I grew up with four moms. I want to go sit down right now and write everything I know about these four moms, because it's true. Uh, what, what will be known of these four women after, after they uh, pass on? And so it's it's something that I it's really struck a chord with me. So thank you for all of the, all of this information you've put together for us. Yeah, in some sense, in some sense, it's the you know the church, the Mormon Church in 2022, is a hundreds of billions, if not a trillion dollar church. It's the wealthiest, it's the wealthiest church in the United States, right? Mm -hmm. And just like America was built on the back of slave labor and, and of Native American displacement, the wealth of the Mormon church was built on the back of abused and neglected polygamous women. Hmm. And that's just a fact. And, and, and if people think I'm cherry picking, this was just my grandma's family. I didn't make this up. I didn't cherry pick. This is the grandma that I knew who was involved in polygamy. And I would encourage everyone to write in. If any of you have studied your polygamous families, either go do it if you haven't, or if you have, I would love to hear other people's stories of the dark underbelly of, of Utah and Mormon polygamy, because I am certain that, that my family is not the only one that that's experienced this sort of dark underbelly, you know? And Absolutely. It, you can't trust the family lore that it was all happy and healthy. And when you hear the Mormon church today do their apologetics, you'll hear them say, oh, but the women all said they loved it. Mm -hmm. And I'll just ask you to go back to a screenshot again. Mormon apologists, did Elizabeth Bull love her polygamy? Did Clarissa Taggart love her polygamy? Did Margaret Shaw love her polygamy? Stop saying that the Mormon women love the polygamy. You can cherry pick and find women who write positively about the polygamy, but it's likely cherry picked and it comes at the neglect of all the women who had a horrendous experience. And I'm certain that Margaret, Edith, Clarissa, and Elizabeth were not the only ones who had horrible experiences. For yeah. sure. For sure. Absolutely. So, I don't mean well, to be so serious and angry, but no, no I mean, yeah. you have it's every a, right to be, and it's your family heritage and it's your ancestry. And you have every right to any emotion that you feel and all of the emotions, like you said, the emotions of, of pride and um, knowing that you come from such strong women and the feelings and emotions of frustration, you're allowed to feel all of those emotions and they don't have yeah. to be mutually exclusive and they don't have to be all one thing. True. Yes. So thank you so, so, so much for putting this together for us, for, uh, for being here for us and for all of our listeners. We really have enjoyed this and, uh, just want to thank you again for doing it. For yeah. I, bet you, I, bet, I bet you guys didn't expect a four hour interview. Right? <laughs> <laughs> this is our first four hour interview and we could not imagine doing with anyone other than you, John. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. perfect. It just and is it's, fitting that I'll be your longest. Hopefully I'll be. That's your fantastic. <laughs> yes. And for anybody that wants to hear more about what it was like for Sam to grow up in polygamy or stories, 
um, of other people leaving polygamy. And we're really just trying to um, share and empower those who have left that community and really raise compassion for those people currently now or people's family and ancestry in the past. And so um, if you like that, please like and subscribe to our channel. Go to Mormon Stories if you're somebody who um, wants to Oh, there's so much, such a plethora of so much information so much and information. so many people's experiences, whether you're in a faith transition, whether you just want to know more so that you can make a consented decision on how you feel about the LDS church, please go check out John DeLynn on Mormon Stories. And we just thank you all for, for listening. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, John. Everyone go subscribe to Mormon Stories and uh, thank you for being here. We'll talk to you guys you are awesome. Like I'm, I'm super honored. Keep up the great work. And uh, you guys, everybody provide growing up in polygamy, provide Sam and Melissa your financial support because it's really hard to do this. And uh, finances, you know, getting some financial support is the only way that people are able to continue. So let's step up and support Sam and Melissa financially so they can they can do this important work. So you guys are great. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you so much, thank John. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, thank you. All right, take care, everybody. Bye.